I wanted to share my testimony just to talk about my 10-year battle with cancer, how I was faced, forced to stare down my fears incarnate, my own mortality, why I'm glad it happened, and how it, it helped strengthen my faith in God. So I'm really doing this for those who are, who are struggling with faith, for those who are suffering, and for those who feel like they don't have any hope in their situation. Um, in September 2007, Lisa and I got married. I was in radiology residency at UT Southwestern in Dallas, and Lisa was an ultrasound tech in uh, Plano, Texas. She was working at a hospital there. About three months later, right on Thanksgiving evening, uh, Lisa was working, I was off, and uh, she, she said that I could get a free Thanksgiving dinner. So I was like, well, I'm not going to turn down a free dinner. So I went up there, and I got my turkey dinner, and after that, uh, she scanned my neck just because it's not busy at hospitals on Thanksgiving around dinner time. And my thyroid gland was just diffusely abnormal. I mean, I, I hadn't seen one like it before, so I wasn't really sure what to make of it. At the time, I was feeling great. I was completely asymptomatic. Uh, the next week, I followed up with uh, a doctor that I trusted, and he scanned my neck just up and down each side and just told me that I had thyroid cancer and that it had gone to all the lymph nodes. In uh, January 2008, a couple months later, I had a thyroidectomy except for a small piece of uh, cancer that was left in my right neck here just because the nerve to my vocal cord passed through it and she didn't want to sacrifice the nerve if she didn't have to. Almost uh, 50 lymph nodes were removed. Most of those had cancer in them. And then I received the, uh, the first of three different radiation pills at that time. February 2011, I developed severe low back pain, just intense pain going down my right leg. Um, I went to work, didn't know what was going to happen, but I ended up making it a couple hours, but then I was just laying on the reading room floor in just absolute agony. I couldn't even, I couldn't even sit up in a chair. I was in so much pain. So they, they took me in a stretcher to go get an MRI, and I had an MRI, and I didn't know what was going on. But I had just a huge disc herniation. It was compressing the nerves, and it was just causing a tremendous amount of pain. So they took me on the stretcher to the neurosurgeon, and that evening I had a emergency surgery to, to remove the disc. About a month and a half after that, I thought my back had healed enough and things had seemed calm. So I went to Dr. Netterville, who's a, a world-renowned head and neck surgeon in Nashville, to get the last little piece of the thyroid cancer in, in the right part of my neck removed, just because the labs and imaging study, studies showed that it was worsening. So it was only a six millimeter nodule, just a little piece. So I was thinking, well, what could possibly go wrong? This is going to be, I'm going to be fine the next day. It's not going to be a big deal. So I have the surgery uh, Friday afternoon, but after the surgery, I don't remember this, but I was told this, my vocal cords were so swollen that I, that I couldn't even breathe on my own. I had what's called strider, and uh, they had to keep the, uh, the endotracheal tube, the tube down my throat, in place just so that I could breathe on my own. So because of that, they had to place me in a medically induced coma um, for three days, so I woke up on Sunday instead of Friday afternoon, and I woke up with a tracheostomy in my neck just so that I could breathe. The other surprise when I woke up is that my back pain and my leg pain were back, and just as it was intense, it was I was in agony. So I had the tracheostomy for ten days. I was eventually discharged. Lisa and I drove me. Lisa drove me back to Jacksonville. After we got back to Jacksonville, my urine turned black because I had so, different, so many different muscle cells that were dying. And um, a repeat MRI just showed that the, that the, the disc herniation had, had come back or it was, it, was, it was still there, still pressing on the nerves. Anyway, it was, it was not a successful surgery. So in the debilitated state that I was in with the raw post-surgical neck, I was informed that I would need another back surgery. So I was bed bound for about a month while I was healing and awaiting my next trip to the operating room. When I, when I came back from that neck surgery, I couldn't lift my arm either. It was a nerve injury, but I mean, I had so many issues. I was dealing with, you know, the, um, the incision 
from my neck was it was looking like it was getting a little bit infected. I was having so much back pain. So I mean, the fact that I couldn't lift my arm wasn't that high on the list. The neurosurgeon I, that I talked to and I set a date because um, I had to have a mental date that, hey, there's going to be a point at which this pain won't be there anymore. So I, it was, I was insistent I need, a, I need a surgery date so I can at least see an end to this because this is unbearable pain. I mean, even just even just using the bathroom was incredibly painful. Um, I, I dreaded going to that neurosurgery appointment because um, I would have to sit up and I'd have to go to a waiting room and I'd have to get up on an exam table and just those basic things that are just such easy movements, they were just excruciating. Um, getting into the wheelchair, Lisa had to push me in a wheelchair um, up the ramp to the elevator and I'm just in so much pain. She gets me to the neurosurgeon's office and I'm lying on the floor in the uh, the waiting room and just people are staring at me. <laughs> it's just like, why well, is he on the floor? <laughs> and uh, so that was a really painful point. And then I had to go do the pre-op and I was like, oh gosh, go, go get a chest x-ray and an EKG. And it sounds like nothing, but I mean, if the pain was so intense and I was having a tremendous amount of anxiety after, before that and after that second surgery. I would, um, I was having just, just night terrors. I mean, I would just, it was like a whole night long nightmare just about my back and about my future. And I would, I would wake up in such anxiety and I would, I would have soaked the, the bed, soaked the sheets with just sweat just from so much anxiety about the situation. and it being unsuccessful and unsuccessful and it not going well and how did how did it come to this you know but I mean it, it was during that time after that second back surgery well it was just it was just too much for one human and I just started to cry that's when I really started to cry out to God I was like God if you're there help me I need help am I gonna be okay you know if did did I do something to deserve this if if I did, let me know. You know, I will. <laughs> I will repent of everything. But, you know, but it was just so hard because I I was just praying again and again and again. Um, but I just wasn't hearing anything, and I wasn't getting any answers. It was you know just radio silence, and I was just left with tremendous pain. I would go to bed in pain. I would wake up in pain. I just had this relentless hope. I was like, this. That's my only shot. I mean. What other chance is there? I mean, I, I, there's really no other hope, you know, than that, than that he's going to heal me. But my parents during that time, they, they lived about an hour away. Um, they brought me a book, uh, 90 Minutes in Heaven, which is a story of uh, Don Piper, who's a pastor. He had a near-death experience. He was in a horrific car accident, basically died, went to heaven, and came back to tell the tale. And that was that was really the the story that I needed to hear during that time because it, you know, was very clear that from that book that that God was real and that sometimes just bad things happen to good people and it's just unexplainable. Then there was not an explanation in that book as to why it happened. It just happened. So I just had to just take it that sometimes this stuff just happens and I I didn't get an explanation. So after the second back surgery, it, it was successful. Um, the, the pain, the pain after that was the shooting pain down my leg was gone, but I mean I still had all the the muscle pains. I had uh, a disc that was just cut on, so I mean I had back pain, and I mean for even years afterwards. Um, so it, it was still really difficult to get through. You know, I, I'd read a lot of different stories and testimonies during that time, and one was a, a woman who had, had prayed for a white feather as a confirmation for her prayer, and um, she received a white feather as confirmation. So there were so many times during that year I just prayed again and again for a white feather, just one white feather, just, just tell me, God, one time that it's going to be okay, just, just one time. But I never got a white feather. Even years later, I would just pray for the the white feather, the confirmation, and it just, it just didn't come. And that, and that was really hard. It's like, why, why did she get the white feather, but I don't? I mean, what am I, what did, what did, why am, you know, why, why are we not on a 
talking basis. <laughs> so it, it was just so many different things that just didn't make sense to me that I didn't even understand. Okay. So in, um, on November 4, 2012, my dad passed away from melanoma. And that was real difficult on me and the entire family. And I thought, well, surely next year, you know, it was going to be better. But I was wrong. At the end of uh, December 2013, even though I'd never recovered from 2011, um, the vision in my left eye got kind of cloudy, almost like I was looking through a cloudy uh, shower door. And I just was like, oh, you know, I have astigmatism or something, whatever, you know. So I followed up with an op optometrist, and uh, she took all these images, and she seemed really worried. And then she showed me all these pictures of my retinas, and I had all these little areas of bleeding on each side. And I asked her, is my vision going to come back? Is am I going to be able to continue working? And she said, well, I'm not sure. You need to follow up with the ophthalmologist after the three-day New Year's weekend. So I got blood drawn to help figure out why, why this was happening. Um, the disorder is called uh, central, vetinal, central retinal vein occlusion, and basically the, the veins behind my eyes were clotting. And, um, so, but a few days later, I got a, a voicemail from my primary care doctor, kind of urgent, saying, hey, I got your blood test results back. Your white blood cell count is 20 times normal. I talked to the oncologist, and um, it sounds like you have chronic myelogenous leukemia. So basically, um, in chronic myelogenous leukemia, there's a, a cell that goes haywire, and it's a, uh, an enzyme that's like an on switch, and it just turns on, and it starts producing all these leukemic cells like crazy. Um, usually cells have on and off switches. This one is on, and it just produces uh, leukemic cells. So my, my white blood cell count was 20 times normal, and my blood had become sludge. So I go and follow up with the oncologist, and they do the bone marrow biopsy and confirm that that's what it is. So I was on medications that, to get the white blood cell count down. They initially did, did a procedure where they would spin off all the white blood cells just to get my white blood cell count down, just to save my vision. And then I took another medication to get my white blood cell count down a little bit further, just to suppress my bone marrow. And um, once, once it was safe, I got off that medication and went to the other medication, which is um, specifically for chronic myelogenous leukemia. I had this Inspirations app on my phone where it gives me a Bible verse every day, and I hadn't looked at it yet at that day. Um, but I, I, I told God, I was like, Lord, if you don't have a, a message from, from me today, we're done. Because every time, you know, I say all these prayers, but all I get is more pain and more suffering and more cancer. More cancer, and my my dad is now dead, and everything just keeps getting worse. So if you don't have a verse for me today, we're done, and that's that's the end of the story. So I go to the verse, and it's Proverbs three, five, and six, which is uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. So I just had to just take a deep breath and say, I, I know that's from the Lord and I know that's his answer and I didn't understand. It didn't make any sense. How could that be the right answer to this situation? So, but I knew I just had to, to trust him in it. Um, and the next morning when I woke up, I just had a sense of peace just about the situation and I was in a very positive mood. I had the the hospital coffee with the powdered coffee mate powder and it was like an awesome cup of coffee. I was just like this, I'm fine, this is going to be fine. Um, but they did tell me I'm going to have to be on this toxic chemotherapy pill for years, probably my entire life, and to just kind of prepare for that. So at this point, remember my vision was still um, an issue, and so I had to go to the ophthalmologist over multiple months and get multiple injections into my eye with chemotherapy to try to get rid of this this um, vein condition that I had. So that that eventually returned my vision to normal. 
Um, and uh, the leukemia responded uh, slowly in me. It, it responded more, slow, more uh, slowly in me than did in other patients. So that was also really frustrating and uh, tedious process. There was one point when I went from 0.33% to 0.3% over a full year. So I was just kind of doing the the curve, and it's like I'm not gonna be done with this leukemia thing till I'm 50. And there were so many side effects. They're just awful side effects from muscle pain. So I couldn't think straight. I couldn't talk straight. Um, so many different things that uh, I really did not want to be on it. But I didn't really have much in the way of other options. Now, that was that was the treatment. You could do that, or you could get a bone marrow transplant. But then if you get a bone marrow transplant, you have about a one in three chance of dying the first year. So that wasn't a very good option either. So 2014 to 2016 were just absolutely awful. I felt like my life was over as I knew it. I thought that the, the good days were, were done. I didn't really even want to be alive anymore. But I, I just prayed so many times, God, just, just, just cure me or kill me. Just make a decision. And I was, I was actually jealous of elderly people because they were closer to death. And I'd see them in their walker and I'd be like, you know, lucky guy. But that, that was my state of mind. I was just, every day was just torment. And then so it was just this slow motion blur of back pain and doctor's visits. Every single vacation day I had was a doctor's visit. I had weekly blood draws, there's all these side effects. I was uh, waking up and uh, going to sleep with anxiety and depression every single day. I mean, it was just on me like a cloak every single day. I just had tremendous fear about just all these different things, my back issues, just this life of pain, just never getting off chemotherapy. I was just, I mean, why would I be optimistic? Because every year was just as bad as the one before, and the general trend was everything just seems to keep getting worse. So it was really scary, and I didn't know how to process it all, but I just, just kept making it to the next meal, making it to the next day, and just doing, doing the best I could. At one point um, later on, I think this was 2016, um, the labs just were not improving enough. And I had this phone call with my oncologist. We were waiting for the results to get back on my most recent blood draw so I could get to find out, you know, if, if it was improving or getting worse. And the oncologist kept saying, bone marrow transplant, bone marrow transplant. And I, and I just, I, I don't even, I, I, I wasn't even understanding what he was saying. I was just so focused on this. Why does he keep saying that? Why does he keep saying that? I thought he, I thought this was, this was truly next in line. Um, so, after that phone call, I mean, that, that was kind of rock bottom after that phone call. It's like, oh my God, I'm really, I'm really going to have a bone marrow transplant. Like, there's really a one in three chance I'm going to die. And uh, I was like, how, how did it come to this? You know, I'm seeing like my own obituary. I just, I mean, that was, that was the official end to my human strength. I was, I think I was, uh, eight years in at this point to all these different things happening and it just kept getting worse. And that was, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. That was as much as I could take. And it was just too much for too long. And I, I heard the song um, Oceans by Hillsong and it just kind of hit the situation. And the lyrics were, you call me out upon the waters, the great unknown where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, and oceans deep, my faith will stand. It was just made uh, abundantly clear during that time that I had zero control over the situation, zero control over my life, and that my soul would just have to rest in the shadow of the Almighty, that I just, I can't do this on my own anymore. So I prayed for, uh, for hope, for healing, for a future, because I wasn't sure I had a future. So, and I prayed, uh, I 
prayed, Lord, if I rise, let me rise on you. So my numbers slowly improved, and I fortunately did not need the bone marrow transplant. So in, in uh, April 2017, I just saw that during the, during the darkest times of 2011, um, during the bone marrow transplant scare, I just saw that God was there giving me hope, faith, comforting me during those difficult times. And uh, right about that time, I, d I had obtained all the evidence that I need to make my decision. And I, t I decided to commit my whole heart and mind to following the Lord because previously I harbored some doubts and uh, um, I did not completely believe, I'll be honest. And, on, and shortly thereafter, right after I made that decision, I'm gonna follow the Lord with all my heart. Right after, April 23rd, I was taking out the trash. I was playing on my uh, phone Hillsong's song, Oh Praise the Name. It was a week after Easter, and that's when it happened. You've heard, uh, knock and the door will be opened. Well, God, <laughs> God ripped the door open, ripped it off its hinges, and like splintered it into a thousand pieces. It was like the, the sky opened up, the presence of the Lord was on me like a tidal wave. There was, there was no doubt whatsoever. Um, and I was just completely overwhelmed. I was just crying so hard. I'm, I'm here taking out the trash <laughs> and I'm just crying is, it, incredibly hard just in the driveway. I'm just, oh my goodness, what is going on here? So um, after that, I just I have to go to the backyard to just finish crying and calm down because I didn't want my family to see me like this. Um, I look up in the sky and there's this huge rainbow, and uh, and I'm not the type that gets emotional taking out the trash. That has never happened before. <laughs> so I knew something supernatural had happened, um, and within one week, that depression and anxiety that had they had been my constant companions for years. They'd just gone, just evaporated. I was, my soul was saved. I was a new creation in Christ. I, I was truly waking up in a different world, and a world where I knew I'd never be forsaken. That that tremendous fear I had, it was just gone. And uh, that May, just the following May, um, was a devotional month. I read most of the New Testament. Um, every night I'd listen to Christian music as I was going to sleep. And um, one song in particular, I would listen to uh, the song called Your Word by Hillsong. And the lyrics resonated in my soul, which were, Your word will never fail me, like a fire in my bones, like a whisper to my soul. Your word is revelation. And I truly believed that Chronic myelogenous leukemia could not survive in the presence of the Holy Spirit. So I prayed for the Holy Spirit to be the fire in my bones. And I visualized the Holy Spirit burning up all these leukemic stem cells that are all throughout my bone marrow. And at the end of uh, May, I decided I wanted to go one step further in my faith and just unconditionally surrender my life to the Lord, to Jesus Christ. But I said in that prayer that this was important to me and I wanted to know that he accepted. Well, I didn't have to wait long. Now was at about nine or 10 o'clock at night. The following morning at 4 a.m., Lisa wakes me up and says, I'm in labor, take me to the hospital. So not long after that, Anna was born, our third child and the, uh, the umbilical cord was wrapped around her neck three times, which is a holy number, but she was born pink and not blue, and she was completely unscathed. And the obstetrician remarked that it's incredibly rare for a child to be born with uh, the umbilical cord wrapped around their neck three times. So I received my answer that the Lord accepted. And a few months after that in September, I just felt like God was speaking to me uh, again through through a song, and it was a song "Empires" by Hillsong, and there were certain lyrics. And I just feel like he would he would highlight the the lyrics in my mind that he would want me to to know, and the uh, the lyrics were, 
Beneath our skin, a new creation, the night is done, our chains are broken, the time has come, the wait is over, the King is here, and his name is Jesus. And um, right after that, my labs came back, and they, the oncologist told me the leukemia is completely undetectable, not even one in a million cells. It's a 0, 0.00. And uh, I got off the phone with my mom after that, told her the good news, I'm really excited, and I look up in the sky, and there's this huge cloud, and uh, it's in the shape of a feather. And I, I just smiled, because I knew exactly what it was, I mean, and I knew exactly who it was from, and I knew exactly why it was there. The cool thing was, you know, I just asked for a little feather, but he put it in the sky, so it was so much better than what I could have even dreamed of. But also, in doing that, he removed the fear of it coming back, too. So each time I get these blood draws, I, every time I think of that feather, I'm just like, it's... He told me it's fine. You know, he put the feather in the sky. It's not coming back. I'm not worried about it. There are several things I want, I want people to know. That, um, and one of those is just that my only hope during this suffering was that Christ was real and that he'd get me through it. And he did, because I just wasn't strong enough to make it on my own. There was just too much. Life was just too hard. I saw the uh, parable of the wise and the foolish builders played out in uh, Luke 6. And if my spiritual house had not stood on the solid rock of Christ, it would have collapsed and my destruction would have been complete. And of that, I am sure. And um, I knew that Jesus Christ was there the whole time. A lot of time I felt alone. Actually, almost all the time I felt alone. But as I look back on all these different instances and scenarios of the worst, the worst and darkest moments, I could just see the fingerprints of God so clearly visible. And I also want people to know that the, the scripture, the Holy Bible is true. And um, in John 4, they talk about a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And at one point um, during that devotional month, I actually, I physically felt that in my soul. I physically felt the water like welling up. And I'd never felt that before, and it was just amazing, and it was just another confirmation of all these different things. I felt perfect love cast out fear, you know. Anxiety is a form of fear, and the anxiety was gone. And I don't, I don't have to intellectualize Christianity anymore. A lot of times when I was in my process of building my faith, I had to intellectualize it. and. Um, but I don't anymore because my soul knows its maker and just confirms that it's the truth and it just happened time and time and time again. And uh, there were times I didn't believe some of the scripture when I was reading it. I was like, that, that can't be true. But and one, an example is the parable of the vine with, when Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. But during this trial, there was a time where I almost lost my vision so I almost couldn't see. There was a time I couldn't walk. There was a time I couldn't even breathe on my own. So I, I realize that all these things I can do are, are purely by the grace of God. I'm just kind of amazed that God would do those kind of things for me. You know, it's just a lot of times it's like, who am I to, you know? Because I feel like through this process that he selected me in, in some way because I was clearly going down the path that was not the right path even though I thought it was the right path. And in, in Proverbs it says that, so, uh, forget the verse exactly, but the, the path that you think is right leads to destruction. And that verse scared me because I didn't understand it the first time I read it. <laughs> um, but I just feel almost fortunate that God would redirect me and give me the detour back to the path of righteousness like you are not going to go this way you are going to have thyroid cancer and you're going to have back pain and you're going to have seven surgeries and you're going to have leukemia and you're going to have a lot of time to think and you're going to have time to make a decision and what's your decision and there was a time there right before i decided that this thought would just keep popping into my head and it's like will you serve man or will you serve God and I just kept thinking about that because for my whole life I just 
served man. I'd served myself, and I looked. My my opinion of myself was based on my opinion of what others, other human beings, would think of me, and not what God would think of me. And um, and it hadn't gone well. <laughs> just to put it to put it uh, simply, it just it hadn't gone well. And uh, I was like, well, this isn't working. <laughs> and so I kept thinking about that, and I was like, I am going to follow God. That's my final answer. So once I did that, just I had that experience in the driveway, and it was just God accepted me into His kingdom, and it was it was just a new, just a completely uh, new life. Um, I had known about mathematical patterns in the in the Bible. I heard about Tim Tebow's story of his uh, John 3:16 game. So I started looking for patterns in my life, and um, there are numbers of significance in the Bible that denote completion or fulfillment, and there are those numbers are three, seven, ten, and twelve. And I looked, started thinking about all these things that I had been through, and I had three radiation pills, three bone marrow biopsies, I had three days in a coma, three cancers, I had, um, there was three times that the umbilical cord was wrapped around Anna's neck. Um, I was saved three years, three months, and three weeks after being diagnosed with leukemia when I got the verse from Proverbs 3. I had three waves of suffering, each space three years apart, each one worse than the year, each one worse than the one before. For the number seven, I was diagnosed um, with cancer first in 2007. I had seven days in the ICU. There were seven surgeries. I was saved seven days after Easter of 2017. And the hotel that I stayed at when we saw the feather in the sky was on 17th Street off of US Highway 70. For the number 10, I had 10 days with the trach and um, 10 years of cancer, and I had support of my wife during 10 years of marriage. And on 9 19 when I get to come off the chemotherapy, that'll be 12 years, and also my mom's 70th birthday. And I just, uh, I also heard the, uh, the testimony of Jim Monroe on I Am Second, and he also was a leukemia patient. I think he had a different leukemia, but he received a bone marrow transplant and became a new creation on April 23rd. And that was the same exact day that I had that experience in the driveway when I was saved and became a new creation. And I just thought, what is special about 423? So I looked through the New Testament and Ephesians 423 is to be made new in the attitude of your minds. The fears have faded away. Um, the fears about my back, about my cancer, about death, I just don't carry that, that burden anymore. It's just so much more peaceful to rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And um, I'm thankful for Lisa. She never wavered, not once. Every time I was there and I woke up in the ICU, she was there by my side. Um, our marriage became strengthened during the process since we were united against a common enemy, which was my health. I'm much more loving and supportive father than I think I would have been if all these things had not have happened to our three kids. I've realized that my identity is in Christ and not my profession or any material belongings. My relationship with God, my view of God, changed drastically for the better during these years because I just wondered why for so long he was just pouring out this cup of wrath on me, but Allowing the suffering was his way of leading me out of my stubbornness to complete surrender and the salvation of my soul. And I was just amazed that he would just go to such lengths to get me into his kingdom that I was just grateful for that. And I didn't like the road, but uh, I think the end justified the means. And uh, to use an analogy, to, to be forged, um, iron must go through the fire. And to make new wine, uh, grapes must go through the wine press. So how do you compare 10 years with eternity? So, so I'm grateful for those 10 years.